Mr. Belcher here again with another screencast. This is the Growth of a Young Nation Part 3, specifically referring to Manifest Destiny and the Texas Rebellion and really their bid for independence. Our learning outcomes for today, number one, what is Manifest Destiny and how was the idea carried out by the United States government and its people? And the second thing, what were the causes and effects of the war with Mexico? So let's get to this thing. Manifest Destiny, what is it? You can see this picture here by John Gast, American Progress. Just take a look at this for a second. Analyze it. You may want to pause the video even. We have Columbia right here in the center, as you can see here. And what is she doing there? On the, on the right-hand side, what does it look like? Just take a second. And then what is on the left-hand side? So just take a second. Maybe you want to jot a few things down, what you think is going on in this picture. On the right-hand side, she's... What at least what I see is she's bringing the light to everything that's on the left. And think about if you're looking at a map of the United States from le from right to left, you're going from east to west. So she's bringing the light to the west. And you can kind of see here in the background there's some, it kind of looks like early kind of poles possibly there in the background. And also what's happening there on the kind of this bottom left-hand side is people are fleeing. So what does that tell you? That's kind of interesting. Maybe uh, they're fleeing for a reason. So first thing, manifest meaning obvious movement, or it is obvious that we are supposed to do these things. And it really starts to begin in the 1840s heavily. Uh, we have, you know, dating back to early 1800s with, the, with Lewis and Clark and their expedition west, that's all fine. But it really takes until the 1840s for this fever of expansion to really take hold. And what it really has to do with is people believing that this movement west to the Pacific Ocean was predestined by God, that this was God telling us that we must go from sea to shining sea. And really they move west for practical reasons too, not just the predestination by God, but one of the major things is the land itself. The land that these people are working on, specifically in the south, has been overworked by these by the cotton crop. And they're, it's so profitable that they're just simply planting and planting as fast as they can. The problem is, is cotton is destroying the, the ground itself. And, and it's really going to start to just ruin the soil and become kind of uh, terrible ground to try and plant anything in. So they're going to gather all their things and move west to kind of greener pastures, if you will. The second thing is personal economic problems. Throughout this time period, especially after Andrew Jackson in the 1830s, we're going to start to see this kind of these mini panics and many kind of downturns in our economy. So people are going to be losing things and they're going to be trying to go west for a new life for themselves. And last thing, a new market. We have this kind of increase in railroad activity. So we're going to start to see the linking of some of these smaller towns. And for obvious reasons, people need to sell things, want to sell things. And by moving west, they're going to create new markets for themselves to sell their goods. So westward expansion itself, there's a couple trails that we want to talk about specifically. The Santa Fe Trail, which starts in Independence, Missouri, and ends in Santa Fe, New Mexico, hence the name Santa Fe Trail. And probably the more famous of them, if you probably played the game as a kid, Oregon Trail. It starts in the same place, Independence, Missouri, and goes to Oregon City, Oregon. I don't know about you, I was always the banker. Uh, they gave me the most money. We also want to talk about the Mormons for just a second, too. The Mormon migration, they're, gonna, they're not always going to be in, in Utah. This is, this is not where they originate from. They actually start in New York City. And the reason that they even start their migration is because their leader gets tragically killed. Uh, he's murdered, actually. So what they are doing, just like any other uh, group of people really from the early 1600s on, is they're trying to escape persecution, and they're going to move west to kind of do that. And they're going to go across a few states uh, kind of really a, on a walk, very similar kind of to the Trail of Tears, but uh, they're going to have the necessary supplies. And they're going to settle, uh, led by Brigham Young, in what we would call today that Salt Lake City, Utah area. So walking across Nebraska, Wyoming, and the Rockies. Could you imagine walking across the Rocky Mountains, okay, trying to find a passageway through that? Uh, that's absolutely incredible. Take a look at this map here. You can kind of see the, the two different trails. Again, s starting in Independence, Missouri, and going to Santa Fe, New Mexico, you can see the one that's farther south there. And then you have the Oregon Trail, the more famous of the trail, going kind of through Salt Lake City. You can kind of see the Mormon trek there out of Illinois. You can kind of see there... This map itself shows it going starting in Illinois, but they kind of started from New York City and then moved through Illinois and then across in Nebraska and Wyoming uh, to settle there in Salt Lake. Now the Texas Rebellion itself. Now how does this even come about? Well, 
Mexico gets its independence from Spain in the 1820s, and what they're actually doing is encouraging Americans to settle there, strangely enough, because they, they want Americans there because they want our, our, the money is much more stable than, than Mexican money at this point. So they're going to encourage us to settle there. The land itself is pretty inexpensive, which is going to be a big draw for all those people that are kind of hurting from the personal economic crisis that just happened in the 1840s. One of the major, major kind of players there in Texas is Stephen Austin. You think of Austin, Texas, here's where the name came from. He had land grants from his father, and really throughout his time there in Texas early on, he is going to uh, give out close to 300 personal land grants to people. And he is going to petition Mexico itself for self-governance uh, in that what we would call Texas today. He wants to establish a independent uh, area where no drunkard, no gambler, and no profane swearer and no idler would be allowed. So no drunks, no gamblers, no people swearing. Idler meaning someone who basically does nothing, who's lazy. So he wants people that are going to be there to work. As Stephen Austin is trying to petition for the self-government, he's going to go to Mexico City, and as he's kind of talking to the government there, as he's leaving, he's going to be arrested for inciting a revolution. And what this is going to lead to is a lot of mini rebellions that are going to happen. Uh, by 1835, once he comes, kind of is allowed back to, to his settlement there in Austin, he is going to be firmly in belief that war is going to be the only solution for their independence. Throughout this whole time period, the major kind of sticking point problem-wise is some cultural issues. Uh, there's a language barrier, of course, between uh, speaking Spanish and speaking English, and also there's a big, big question over slavery. Uh, slavery gets prohibited in Mexico in 1829. Now, by the 1830s, uh, these Southerners that are moving there, they're, of course, bringing their slaves with them. They're not granting them their freedom, so uh, the Mexican government is going to be really opposed to that as well. And ultimately, the bigger question that's going to be kind of raised here is, what is admitting Texas really going to do to the balance of free states and slave states in Congress? Because at this point, we're still kind of adding them in pairs, and we'll kind of talk about the different kind of compromises in the, in the next video. So what's going to happen with this? Is, this? is it going to become a slave state, and the slave states are going to have more power in Congress, or what is going to happen here? So uh, that's a, going to be, like I said, the major, major kind of sticking point within Congress itself for annexation. Now, the Alamo itself, like I said, with Stephen Austin kind of being arrested and for inciting revolution and these little mini rebellions kind of taking place, the idea is war may be the only answer. So here's the Alamo, if you haven't seen it, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, it is a fort, and you can still go there today. Of course, maybe some of you have been there. So what is actually happening at the Alamo? Why is it important? Okay, Again, like I said, it's a fort in San Antonio. Uh, we have some of, some of these Americans that are going to kind of barricade themselves inside, and Santa Ana's troops are going to lay siege on the Alamo for 13 days, uh, constant fighting, constant trying to get over the wall of the fort. And sadly, all 187 Americans that were inside fighting for, for their freedom are killed. A couple of the guys you may have heard of before, Davy Crockett and Sam Bowie. Uh, maybe you've heard of the Bowie knife, for example. The rallying cry is going to become known as Remember the Alamo, and this is going to be kind of used in the next uh, major battle between the Mexicans and these American people. Uh, a guy by the name of Sam Houston, again, hence the name uh, in Houston, leads Americans to Santa Ana's capture, and kind of the rallying cry is Remember the Alamo, and this is going to be a very, very short battle where the Americans are really going to just massacre Santa Ana's troops. And through kind of Santa Ana's kind of return to Mexico, there's going to be signed the Treaty of Velasco that's going to give independence to Texas. And again, it's going to raise the question, what are we going to do with slavery? Are we going to annex them to the United States and make them a state? And if we do, are they going to be a slave state? So that's going to be a major kind of question here moving forward. A few years, kind of in, later in the 1840s, James K. Polk, he's a slave owner, mind you, is now becoming president. Uh, he's been favoring annexation of Texas. What he believes is a war with Mexico is going to kind of 
be beneficial for the United States. A war with Mexico could bring Texas into the Union, New Mexico, and California, and kind of it would be the second largest territory that we would uh, have acquired. I have war in quotes here because it's really not much of a fight. Uh, there's the people that are in New Mexico, as soon as they're uh, met by these American soldiers, they're basically going to be waving a white flag and say, hey, we'd rather be part of the United States than Mexico anyways, don't, don't hurt us. And then same thing goes for California. There's not much fighting that's going to go on there. Uh, they simply just would rather be part of the United States than anything else. There is going to be a little bit of fighting down in the kind of the, the southern Texas Rio Grande area. Uh, Ultimately, in 1848, it's going to lead to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and this is going to end the war, and Mexico is going to get paid for the, the territory that, that they lose. Uh, again, they figure $15 million for California, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and Wyoming. And again, like I said, the second, it's the second largest territorial acquisition from uh, aside from the Louisiana Purchase. So this is a really big deal, and Polk... Uh, has the outcome that he was looking for and more really so now we are going to firmly have that manifest destiny of sea to shining sea but the bigger question again still remains how is this going to affect slavery what are we going to do with this okay so uh keep that in mind as we go forward in the next couple of weeks here this is going to be a few years later about it's about five years later this gadsden purchase area uh, you can see here in the southern part of what is now Arizona and a little bit of New Mexico. This wasn't in the initial Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This is going to be authorized later, and we're going to pay Mexico again uh, $10 million for just this little bit of area. So they actually get a really good deal with this area right here, considering that they had to give up so much before for only $15 million. This is, is two-thirds of that amount. So check out this map here. By eight, Looking at 1830, where we are uh, at as a as a country. We have Missouri and Arkansas. Arkansas is not even really a state at this point. It's still a territory. We have all this unorganized territory in the kind of upper central and upper north area. And then all of that area that was basically Mexico prior to 1830. So check this out, 1853. Look at the difference from 1830 to 1853, a short 23 years later. California has become a state in 1850 uh, because of the gold rush, thanks to that. And we have the Washington, Oregon, Utah, and New Mexico territories. And you can kind of see it right there in the Gadsden Purchase area in this map, which is not quite uh, ours yet, uh, but soon enough. So really what's going to be the question is, what are we going to do with slavery? And that issue is really going to become a, a sticking point a short seven years from now. So keep that in mind once we hit 1860. Let's recap. What is Manifest Destiny and how is the idea carried out by the United States government and its people? And the second one, what were the causes and effects of the war with Mexico? So consider the Treaty of Velasco, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and that Gadsden Purchase. That's all I got for today. So if you have any questions, see me in class, shoot me an email, uh, let me know, and uh, I will see you guys next time.